Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my Tea Time talk today. Today I'd like to share asynchronous reinforcement learning for real-time control of physical robots. And let's first get started with the agent environment interaction loop in reinforcement learning as we show here, which is this loop from the reinforcement learning introduction book. And based on this loop, we can usually implement the reinforcement learning algorithm uh, in this way. So for each time step T, we sample action AT from the agent based on the current state ST, and we execute the action AT in the environment, receive the feedback from the environment, which are the reward signal RT plus one at the next state ST plus one from the environment. Then the agent will use this transition data, uh, ST, AT, RT plus one, and ST plus one to make a learning update. And uh, most of the deep reinforcement learning algorithm we use are implemented in this way, and it is totally appropriate in simulated environments. But if we uh, deploy this kind of implementations into the real world, into a real world environment, it's going to be problematic because of this update stuff. Uh, depending on the complexity of our model and uh, the dimensionality of our data, this step, the update step, will always take some time. And uh, it is totally fine in simulated environments because in simulated environments, after the environment emits the reward signal RT plus one at the next state ST plus one, uh, the environment will actually be paused internally and wait until the agent finishes the update. So no matter how long the update takes, it is totally fine in simulating environments, but it is not the case in the real world in environments because in the real world, we cannot pause time, which means that during the update, the environment will keep executing the, it keep executing the previous action from the agent. So if the update takes a long time, because for example, if our data is very high dimensional, uh, the previous action will be executed in the environment for a long time. And uh, this is a problematic for a robotic system because if we repeat the same action on the robot for quite a long time, uh, that could uh, potentially reduce the responsiveness of the robot and uh, also lead to some safety issues like uh, uh, collision with the surrounding objects. So this is one of the challenges in real world reinforcement learning. And there are many approaches to address this issue. And uh, uh, the approach that we'll be focusing on is to use asynchronous reinforcement learning. So the algorithm sketchy we show here is what we call sequential re reinforcement learning because in this algorithm sketchy, every step of the computation are computed sequentially, step one, step two, step three, and for doing this for every time step. And and uh, in contrary, uh, for asynchronous reinforce for asynchronous reinforcement learning, we will actually divide this algorithm into two parts. The first part, process one, will be mainly focused on the agent environment interaction, interacts with the environment and stores the transition data, and 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 store the transition data. And in process two, uh, uh, it will be mostly responsible for the update using the transition data. And if we let the two processes run asynchronously, then in that case, uh, during the agent environment interaction, there will be no learning involved so that we don't have the issue we mentioned. We don't have the issue we mentioned. So uh, in this work, we would like to investigate for the same algorithm, which is soft actor critic we use, uh, how the sequentially implemented version and asynchronously implemented version differ in performance in real world robotic control tasks. Now let's first uh, briefly introduce soft actor critic. Uh, soft actor critic is an efficient off policy algorithm for continuous control based on policy iteration framework and the maximum entropy reinforcement learning objective. Uh, the critic in soft and critic can be trained by minimizing the soft film and residual, which is shown here. And the soft value function is defined as the expectation of the Q value under the expectation of the 
current policy plus the entropy of the current policy scaled by alpha. And because of this entropy bonus, it is called the soft value function. And the entropy bonus is scaled by alpha, which is a temperature parameter. And the actor in soft actor critic can be optimized as maximizing both the Q value under the expectation of the current policy, as well as the entropy uh, scaled by alpha. And this basically makes sure that throughout the training period, the agent has sufficient exploration uh, so that it, it does not trap in any uh, local, optimal, uh, local optimal policies. And for the environment we use, we call it the visual UR5. And this is, uh, uh, and it basically consists of three components. First is a monitor that displays the target and the target is shown as a red dot here. And the second component is the UR5 robotic arm, which we will control with the SOC algorithm. And the third component is a camera, which takes images in front of the robotic arm and the image from the camera was shown on the right. And all the three components are connected to the workstation. And generally the idea of the, this environment is that we apply low level control to this robotic arm and get it close to the target, which is a red dot here as much as possible. So for the environment, uh, so for the observation space of the environment, uh, there are three parts. The first part is three recent images and they're stacked together. The reason we stack images is that we want to give the agent about, uh, about the information about uh, how the target is moving. And the second part is the uh, joint angles and the joint velocities uh, from the UR5 robotic arm, which is a 10 dimension vector. And the third part is a previous action, which is a five dimension vector. The reason we add a previous action to the observation space is because um, uh, the image observation is involved in our environment, which makes our environment highly non malkovian So we want to add more historical information to the observation space so that uh, the agent can learn easily. And for the action space, we actuated uh, five joints on this robotic arm and we sent velocity control commands to the five joints. So the action space is a five dimension vector. Uh, the reward function is defined in two parts. The first part is the area of the target. And the second part is whether the target is centered. Uh, and the reward function basically uh, encourages the robot to get close to the target dot while keeping the target centered in the frame. So, and in this environment, we have two slightly different tasks. First task is reaching in which the target is randomly generated at the beginning of each episode uh, and uh, stays static during that episode. And the second task is tracking where the target is constantly moving and uh, which makes the task a little bit more challenging. And for the model architecture we use to train our, to train our agent, uh, we first we have a convolutional encoder to process the stacked images. And we use a special softmax to uh, flatten the output from the con uh, convolutional encoder. And then we will concatenate the joint, joint angles, joint velocities and the previous actions we mentioned to this flattened uh, convolutional, out convolutional encoder output, then we will fit this, the whole vector to the critical MLP and actor MLP to get the critical loss and actor loss to train the whole model. And it should be mentioned that um, to train the model, we use the critical loss to train the critical MLP and the uh, convolutional, convolutional encoder, but the actor loss are only used to train the actor MLP because this has been empirically demonstrated uh, that using the actor loss to train a CNN encoder is kind of uh, detrimental to the learning process. So we didn't use actor loss to train the CNN part. And for the experiment, for the experiments, we want to compare the asynchronous, the implemented stack and uh, a sequentially implemented stack, how they differ, how they, dif how they differ in uh, under different computational costs. 
So we basically have three experimental settings. The first setting is a baseline setting, which we use image size of 100 as 160 by 90 and a mini batch size 128. And the second experiment setting is high resolution in which we increase the image size to 320 by 180 and keep the mini batch size 128. And the third setting is a large mini batch setting in which we use image size of 160 by 90, but we increase the mini batch size to 512. So uh, among these three experimental settings, the large mini batch setting is the uh, most computationally expensive one, while the baseline setting is the cheapest one uh, computationally. So we want to evaluate the asynchronous version and a sequential version under these kind of increased computational costs and see how the computational costs affect the performance of the agent. And for the, exper for the experiments, we use two hours training time for each run and we use four seconds as the episode length. And for each result, we're going to show uh, it is obtained with five independent runs. So let's first start it. Uh, let's first start with the sequentially implemented SUC. Uh, for the algorithm SUC, it basically consists of three components. Uh, first is the replay buffer sampling that samples a mini batch from the replay buffer and the gradient update and the action computation. So if the algorithm is sequentially implemented, all the three components will be computed sequentially. And to better understand the time cost of such implementation, we measured the real-time cost of each component, the action computation, replay buffer sampling, and the gradient updates in our baseline setting, and we plot them on the axis. And based on, based on this axis, we can, we can figure out that the minimal action cycle time, in this case, uh, uh, the, minimal, the minimal action cycle time means the minimal time interval between two actions. So the minimal action cycle time is 47 milliseconds because for every action taken, we need to compute all the three parts sequentially. And for the minimal update cycle time, which is the minimal time interval between two gradient updates, it is also 47 milliseconds in this case because it also needs to process all the three parts sequentially. Uh, and uh, this is this is measured in the baseline setting and in the high resolution and large mini batch setting, uh, the the uh, computation time needed for the replay buffer sampling and the gradient updates will increase significantly, so that the minimal action cycle time and the minimal update time will increase accordingly. So if we look at the uh, uh, experimental result of the sequentially implemented SUC, uh, the results shown here are undiscounted episodic return and the left three results are from the reaching task and the right three results are from the tracking task. Uh, we can notice that the overall training that uh, as the computational cost increase from baseline to high resolution, from high resolution to large mini batch, the, perfor the performance uh, drops. And this is understandable as we mentioned. Uh, as the computational cost increase, the time needed for uh, the time needed for the action cycle increases, which means there will be longer and longer time intervals between two actions. And uh, this is quite bad for the robot, for the learning robot, because this could make this could decrease the responsiveness of the robot and uh, prevent it from learning a finer control policy. So what about the asynchronously implemented SUC? In asynchronously implemented SUC, we basically uh, separate the algorithm into two asynchronous processes. One for the environment interaction that is only, that is only responsible for interact with the environment and store the data in the replay buffer. And the second process is a learning update process uh, in which it's doing the replay buffer sampling and the gradient update sequentially. And in this implementation, because uh, there's no learning updates involved in the environment, in the agent environment interaction, so the 
action, so the minimum action cycle time decreased significantly from 47 milliseconds to two milliseconds. So because of this decreased action cycle time, uh, the performance of the asynchronous the implement suck actually uh, it's a lot better than the sequentially than sequential implementation as we can see here for the baseline and high resolution setting the asynchronous implementation almost maintained the same performance and this basically showed the benefit of asynchronous reinforcement learning in the real world however there's a there's very noticeable uh, performance drop in the large mini batch setting. And this is due to the fact that in this, in this asynchronous implementation, uh, the in the learning update process, the replay buffer sampling and the gradient update are still computed sequentially. So if we look at the time cost of the minimal update cycle time, uh, it only decreased from 47 milliseconds to 45 milliseconds, which does not decrease that much. And this uh, indicated that if the time computational cost for the uh, update is extremely high, uh, we, uh, the, this asynchronous implementation may not be doing gradient updates efficiently enough for the agent to learn. So, so we had a slightly modified version of the asynchronous reinforcement, uh, asynchronous uh, implementation in which we divide the uh, learning update process into two asynchronous process. Again, uh, the one is for the replay buffer sampling and another is for the gradient update and uh, they are communicated through a uh, queue. So in this case, we can decrease the uh, minimal update time from the sum of replay buffer sampling and the gradient updates to the maximum of the two. So in which in, in the baseline setting, we decrease the update cycle time from 45 milliseconds to 24 milliseconds, which is like uh, almost doubled the training efficiency of the agents. So if we look at the performance of this modified, modified asynchronous implementation, we, we will notice that it almost maintained the same performance across all the three experimental settings. And uh, here, uh, here's a demo of the learned behavior uh, in our reaching task based on the asynchronous implementation version two. And uh, on the and, and the bottom left corner, it is a video stream. Uh, it's an image stream from the camera during this. Uh, evaluation. Uh, that's it for my tea time talk today. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. Cool. I'll I'll go first. This is a uh, this is really nice that this is being explored, and uh, thought your talk was was pretty clear. Um, uh, I didn't like some of the terms because I'm always I'm always uh, try to be specific, clear about you know try to try to use the right words. Um, yeah, I mean, let me just just do some of the obvious things like. Asynchronous actually reinforce asynchronous reinforcement learning means something else than what you described uh, in in the literature already, and so it's problematic to to do it. Um, of course, I don't like what it's used for, so maybe it'd be good if it was replaced. <laughs> um, uh, and the contrast between asynchronous and sequential that seems funny uh, to, but more importantly. Uh, this is a, this is a subject that, that we in Alberta have been interested in for a while, and there is some prior work on it. And I, you didn't mention any prior work. Is is this, this is totally new? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, because I think it's a tea time talk, and I only have twenty minutes to cover the main idea of the of this work. So I didn't talk much about the background and related works. Yeah. Oh no, you don't think shouldn't think that way. Right? You still got to talk about what's come before, and it actually can help you explain what you're doing by by relating okay. to what's come before. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, I'll do it. I'll just reference uh, Jaden okay. Travnik's paper on real time mm -hmm. learning. Yeah, I know that paper. Now, the difference you you are looking at uh, parallelism, and you so one well so one issue with your results with your presentation of your results is that you didn't really explain how it is that you changed the time step, and yet and yet still collected reward and still still had an evaluation measure that was independent of the time step because yeah. like. Uh, you change the time stack, the, the, the whole notion of return um, is is unclear, you know, because you, you used to have five or 10 rewards, now you've got 20. Um, and you're not you're not counting twice. I don't think you're doing that. I think you're doing something sensible. Um, but uh, but you, you need to say what it is you've done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is actually this is actually a. Uh, important technical detail that I omitted here that that uh, for the asynchronous version we actually use 40 milliseconds as action cycle time throughout the experiments and for the sequential version because the computational cost varies across the different experimental settings so we actually use uh, 80 milliseconds 120 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds as the action cycle time uh, for the three experimental settings and we did uh, scale the reward accordingly based on the ratio between the two action cycle time. So good, glad you did that properly. Um, uh, but the thing that seems like, I don't think there is any fair way of doing it. And what you did is, is arguably unfair. Um, you, you took the same, same computations and by uh, moving them into parallel processes, you assume they would they would run uh, in parallel without any loss, um, and you know isn't that that's that seems that to me seems unfair. You're comparing a, a computer uh, which everything is run in sequence, and then you're just saying, "Well, I'm going to run run in parallel." I mean, uh, yeah, it's different yeah. different setup. Um, yeah, yeah, because the motivation have, for. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. You had you had a, a conventional, a single processor. You could put them in separate processes, but they wouldn't just run uh, at the same speed if they're running in oh, parallel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So I, mean, I guess you could run each one of the processes in parallel. Mm -hmm. okay. right? If you were willing to keep this going, you could do, um, when you sample many, many batches, you could do all those things in parallel. We have to mm -hmm. find some way of talking about the expense that doesn't just assume you have extra, extra processors lying around that can- Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. Okay, but it's it's cool work. Yeah. Thank you. So one thing you didn't mention, I guess it, it was implicit, implicitly mentioned that uh, you learned from pixels from scratch. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, I didn't mention that. You did mention that. So. Uh, but uh, maybe yeah, some emphasis on that because it's, is it easy to do? Is it, like, uh, what is the hardness of that? Has it been, been done on real robot, learning from scratch, using images? What is the state of the art of that? Right, so mm -hmm. that's something I think should be mentioned. Okay. What do you think? What, do you, what is the state of the art? Uh, I think, uh, most people, so for the papers I read, if they are uh, doing the real world robot learning from images, they will pre-train the convolutional encoder to make sure that 
uh, the training on the the training with reinforcement learning does not does not take too long. Yeah, and very I think very few people attempted to train on the image based on a real world robot completely from scratch. Or even at all in the pre-train, oftentimes mm -hmm. you'll see that it's uh, frozen. Mm -hmm. So there is some hardness there, but apparently it didn't take too long for you either. Yeah, right, so. and this uh, this involves some kind of architectural design as I show here, as well as the reward engineering. So that's interesting and probably not yet quite a, a scientific, right? So you did it. I think I think that's kind of your achievement. Uh, I, I think it's uh, important to mention that, of course, uh, uh, someone else uh, uh, reproduced your work, work already by basically uh, running the same thing, uh, a refactored code of that, and, and, and found that it's possible. But one wouldn't one shouldn't expect that if they just uh, start with uh, some kind of CNN, put things together and try to learn. Should they expect that it would work? As, as you're mentioning that the, the choice you made for the architectural design, that was crucial. Maybe, maybe talk a little yeah. bit about that, what, which part was crucial? Like the design of the, the, the size of the CNN or the mm -hmm. special softmax, which one was that? It seems like that is a, an important bit of information if someone wants okay. to really do learning from scratch using images in a short amount of time. Okay, yeah, right. You gonna say it now? Oh uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, one of the important part or maybe the crucial part is actually using the special softmax because uh, after the image is processed by the convolution encoder, it is actually a quite large tensor and it contains a lot of redundant information. Uh, because in our in our environment, we actually just need the coordinate information about the target. So the special softmax will directly convert that large tensor after the convolutional encoder into a compact coordinate representation, uh, which is only uh, 64 dimension. And we concatenate it with other information like preperceptions from the UR5 and fit that into the critic MLP and actor MLP. I think this is actually the crucial part uh, for why this work. Uh, we have a hand up for Osmar. Yeah, very simple question. So thank you. Um, so you, you're basically saying that in a real world, in a, in a real setting, physical world, you recommend mm -hmm. this uh, asynchronous learning. Do you recommend also asynchronous learning in a simulation and why or why not? Uh, I think I would also recommend asynchronous learning in the simulation, but it's not but it's not because of the issue we mentioned for the real world uh, for the real world. Uh, and for uh, for a simulated environment, if we use asynchronous learning, we can actually learn much more faster because we don't have to wait until the environment, uh, interaction to be finished until we can do another gradient update. And this has been showing some kind of asynchronous DQN or other methods that uh, learning in an asynchronous way can make the agent learn faster. Well, I think it depends, right? What you are trying to achieve. If you're trying to do some like scientific experiments, I don't see how that really helps. Uh, but if you you are trying to say pre-train something using simulation and if you want to do it faster, mm -hmm. right? So you want to specify, yeah, yeah. Uh, in what case you want to recommend that like there's an application. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, in a situation where the uh, time cost is very uh, crucial, like we want to train the agent in two hours of real time, and in a simulation. It might be better to use asynchronous learning because it can make the agent to learn faster. But it seems like it's, it can be a problem as Rich specified that like there are other processes uh, running for, for real world, it might, you might justify it, but for simulation, if you're comparing one thing to another, you want to have some control over things. 
right? So mm -hmm. the, the benefit of running things on simulation to compare two algorithms is that you have determinism. So you can have a control of experiment. You lose that having this asynchronicity. It depends now on the computational power of the machine and other things that are running. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, Sheila, you should uh, experiment with your exper uh, with, with your simulations. <laughs> That's a good oh, yeah, point. That's, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah. So it took two hours to train from scratch to the kind of behavior you learned that you showed in your video. Two hours. Yeah. So we used to have your five reacher without images. Right, so it's kind of mm -hmm. like a invisible target in the AR, mm -hmm. and you try to reach that. The agent is not actually looking at any image feedback. Mm -hmm. And how long did that take in compared to uh, that? Like, are you taking substantially more? I think that actually takes uh, three to four hours or three to five hours, if I remember it correctly. That was a not software to critic, right? So that was yeah, yeah. That's that's based that on that's based on PPO or TRPO. I remember. Right. So, and we did run uh, an algorithm similar to software to critic, and that took, I believe, much less than three hours. It took kind of like thirty minutes to reach a plateau. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, because I think those replay buffer based algorithms are more efficient in terms of samples compared with other algorithms. So that's not the point I was trying to make, but uh, <laughs> you know how I feel about replay buffers. Yeah. But I was trying to like uh, really uh, get a sense or, or convey the sense of like, what is the state of the art in terms of doing things on physical robots using reinforcement learning. Now, you said you, you're taking one potential approach, right? So, mm -hmm. but uh, Rich mentioned another work uh, by Travnik and others. It, like, is that work uh, along the same approach or that's a different approach? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a similar approach. If you think carefully, I would say that there the, uh, the setup is that the algorithms being used there are cheap, right? So incremental and cheap. So you don't, mm -hmm. the, the issue is not quite to, uh, quite that the, the, the update is much more expensive than the action cycle time. That's mm -hmm. not the, yeah, really yeah. the issue. So uh, I would say it's, it, it's kind of a different approach. I would say in that work, they are really looking at the ordering the usual ordering that, that's proposed in most reinforcement learning algorithms to split the ordering. Here, that, that's not what you're really talking about, the different yeah. approach. So, so are you the first one to do that? How, uh, yeah, I, I think you, you should have talked about, well, you'll have a chance to talk about it again. So you should, you should talk about the existing works. So did people mm -hmm, yeah. do asynchronous reinforcement learning using, uh, so th that's kind of like your approach and using uh, yeah. physical robots, yeah? Yes. And? Uh, yeah, and uh, but they, they just use the asynchronous reinforcement learning to make sure that the action cycle time can be maintained appropriately, but they didn't do, the, do a compare between, do a comparison between the sequential version and the asynchronous version. But other than that, the, the final version that you showed, people exactly use that. Oh, no, for the, so people actually use this version. Uh, so for the papers I read, people actually use this version in which they use a process to collect the transition data and uh, store the data in a workstation and uh, make learning updates on the workstation. And uh, this is approach that people already use and our modified version is new and uh, I, I don't see any papers that use this kind of architecture. 
which is uh, which probably makes sense if uh, they're not looking at uh, a more computationally expensive setting like bigger yes. images bigger mini batch but you yes. kind of like created tasks uh, where uh, or experimental setups where you now do suffer from even sampling yes. from the replay right. buffer and you didn't talk about another thing that AUG you have right here. Uh, um, yeah, that's another technical detail I omitted here. What is Because I'm afraid that I'm running out of time. What yeah, is so for the uh, so for the AUG, which is a function here, is actually called a random augmentation on images. So for example, uh, because if we are learning from the images and the images are very high dimensional, uh, and uh, for a given time like two hours we, we will not be able to collect a lot of images so uh so people came up with this idea that uh, we randomly crop a large patch from the from the image uh, every time we sample this image for updates uh to to learn from this cropped patch to make sure that we to make the uh, representation we learned it's robust and by doing this uh by doing this we can uh, simply understand it as to diversify the images we have. So to make sure that the representation we learned does not overfit into the very limited amount of images. So, so if you didn't use it, do you expect to have the kind of learning you had? What would happen? Uh, I would ex yeah, I would expect some kind of performance degradation, but I don't know how much. But you did experiment those in simulation, and and, and not only you. So like, uh, there are existing works who did that competition yeah. in simulation, right? Yeah, yeah. Based on the based on the previous works done in simulations with random augmentation, they show that this is critical to successfully learn from pixels in simulations. So, and another thing is, you said it's detrimental to uh, keep the backward path flowing from and through the actor. So mm, yes. isn't that hard to believe? Are you saying that it is detrimental in general or we don't have the right algorithm that can flow? The uh, I think this is actually a bit more algorithm specific. This is a specific to suck. Uh, because for in previous works, people tested to train the convolution encoder with both a critical loss and actor loss with SUC algorithm, and they noticed that the performance is much worse than only using the critical loss to train the convolution encoder. Is there an example of a different algorithm where that actually worked, going the backward pass through actor to the CN? Yeah. I yeah, I think for uh, for PPO, people did use both both laws to train the convolutional encoder, and it it is not that big at all. Yeah, but I'm not sure if anyone compared with this on PPO. Yeah. So I I would say it's an interesting problem. You you do want that information so that right? I don't see why not. And I think it's the deficiency of the algorithm or the algorithms. That's one. So let's talk about the, the problems. The problems I see is that the, to begin with that these algorithms are expensive. And is that necessary? Is that like, do we really need these algorithms to be that expensive? Going through the buffers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we may not definitely because this did consumes a lot of resources on our workstation. Like it uses two twenty gigabytes of memory and uh, use almost all the computational resources on the GPU. And your replay buffer? How big was the replay buffer? Uh, it's uh, one million. So one million images you you are saving. Yes. It's a it's a big big agent. Yes.
So, and if we think about that, then actually the task looks quite small. And we want our AI to solve much bigger problems. So, yeah, it seems like it's a problem. Seems like right now for a modern workstation, you, you kind of like used up the, the whole total resource mm -hmm. of that workstation. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, and and if we try to solve a more complex problem than that, it seems like we, we have an issue, we have a problem. Yeah. So not that the problem is that okay, uh, we if we do not afford, we do not use a a bigger workstation, our learning will be slower. I think the problem is that there will be no learning. It wouldn't even fit. These algorithms yeah. to begin with, they require the kind of resource that you cannot even start running the algorithm, running the agent, running the agent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not. Quite yeah, and scalable. it's definitely impossible to to run this algorithm uh, on an onboard computer. Oh yeah, that's true. Like even the one that you have, that cannot right now run uh, on the usual onboard machines like yeah. Jetson Nano. Yeah. Let alone Raspberry Pi. Yeah. You cannot even scale them down. Hey. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you everyone.